Tēnā koutou, ko Mangai ai te Pura Thompson. I hope I'm here at the Waikato Museum. We have the privilege today of talking to two finalists in the Kingi, Kingi Tu Heitia Portraiture Award and also our inaugural winner. So joining me today is the lovely Regan Bowser and Bodhi friend. Tēnā koe mō tō karakia whakatūwhira i tō tātou nei hui i tēnei uh, ahi ahi he mihi tēnei ki ngā taonga katoa, ki ngā tūpuna, ki te wenika, ngā kaitiaki, uh, ngā, ngā māngai toi o tira ki a kaitau katoa i hare mai i tēnei ahi ahi. Tēnā koutou. I am humble to host in person, I know that we're doing this online uh, as well, our, our kōrero this afternoon, but I'm also humbled to be joined by these two zinger toy beside me and I'll speak a little bit more to their profiles very shortly. When the Kingitanga Portraiture Award was announced, there were some very clear goals that it wanted to achieve. We wanted to nurture the creative talents of our ringatoi, our, our artists. We wanted to showcase, um, showcase their talents and, and not do that just in a local sense, but on the national stage as well. But probably more importantly is to revive, to record, to celebrate our tūpuna and their, uh, their stories uh, and have that be part of our, um, the fabric of our histories and each of every one of our ringatoi having an opportunity to put into that. So we're honoured to have two of our ringatoi who entered into the Portraiture uh, Award, both top 50 finalists and our inaugural winner um, to the awards with us today. Um, I, I might give a wee bit of a background to each of our uh, artists here. We have Bodhi Friend down the end there, his Tainui and Matatua. Um, surprisingly, I, I was very surprised to read this video that you're a self-taught photographer because the, um, the results say something, uh, say something else. Bodhi's a, a maestro with years of experience in graphic design and communications and animation and there's so much there already. I know that you're with the Warriors. We still haven't made that top 10 yet, but I guess the strategy is coming for that shortly. Um, and Bodhi was the inaugural winner of the Portraiture uh, Award with his entry entitled Nanapet. Beside me, in the lovely coral, I have the, the amazing Regan Bowser, Te Arawa, Ngāti Ranginui, Daikoa, Maniapoto, uh, and also of Scottish and Irish um, descent. Your first solo exhibition was in 2005 at Hei Tiki Gallery, Rotorua, to exhibiting all over the world, Italy, Rarotunga, Tahiti, um, your Masters in Visual Arts, but you're also a Farikura teacher and trained in Rumaki Reo and taught in art and mathematics as well. Regan's entry was Guide Susan, a matriarch, not a maiden, and was a top 50 finalist in the Portraiture Awards. For me, your mahi is instantly recognisable in the stories that it tells and the layering um, and definitely the colours as well. So please join me in welcoming our two Rungatoi for this afternoon. <laughs> um, I always think I've, I've spoken enough already, so it's about you know, gleaning from the experience um, of you both. So let's fall into that quite quickly. Can you, uh, I'll start with you, Regan, can you recall the, the moment, the, the spark that in, ignited the toy pathway? Can we start there? What, is there a, was there a moment or are there a series of moments that set you on this amazing journey? Well, that's... Um that happened quite a long time ago <laughs> uh, and for me art has, isn't just something that's outside of us 
for me, art is a, is a way of life. Yeah. So living with my nan and my koro growing up, they were weaving a koro way together, so stripping the muka, and my koro would roll the feathers and the soap, you know, and prepare the ends. So that, that was a five-year process for those two, to make a koro way out of muka. Uh, and my father he used to paint geometric shapes because he loves mathematics. So, um, you know, all these different images and, and play on colours would always happen yeah. coming from his house. And um, Mum was always whipping up clothes out of nothing, you know, these amazing garments. So, for me, art was just a way of life and a way of being. And, and it's quite sad, actually, a lot of our... Um, children that are growing up now, they see it outside of themselves as a subject or mm -hmm. something that's not just naturally that they can do. And I have seen that teaching in schools. Uh, but for me, art has always uh, been a way of life. And then growing up, I asked my nan, I told you know, when you're looking at, what, what, what do you want to be? What do you want to yeah. be? I go to my nan, oh, I want to be an artist, nan. Yeah. And she goes, oh, there's no money in that. You know. <laughs> Go and be a teacher. I was like, a teacher, okay. So I was a teacher, and I'll tell you, I was pretty poor when I was a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those taxes are horrible. <laughs> uh, and it's not until I came back to my mahi toy that I've not only been fulfilled uh, and had extra money, actually, um, but and fulfilled in many other ways. Yeah. And the beauty of art is that we're able to share our stories and celebrate them on the stage. And that's what the opportunity of the two Haiti Awards has yeah. provided me. So, um, There's another level of prosperity that comes from doing what you, you love doing. Yeah. What was the spark, Bodhi? The spark? Um, I'm not too sure, actually. Um, I think the creative side is is part of who we are i think um, if i'm to look back at my upbringing um, it was through the the 80s 90s and and whether it was through cartoons movies video games um, was one side of it um, dad was into drawing low-key like he would draw for us as kids um, i guess unpacking um, since the awards was kind of my mum's affinity for photography, just from a, from a whānau perspective. Yep. She was always taking photos and we've got a big um, chest full of um, family photos that would always, from time to time, go through and rekindle old memories. Um, so I think we're just picking up from, from all these different um, parts of your life and going through school. It was just something that um, I was drawn to, whether it was um, drawing, painting, that kind of thing initially. Um, I then moved into, uh, you know, in a similar fashion, like, oh, how can I make this more practical? And it was graphic design, and it was kind of trying to fit it into that box of trying to make a career out of it. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it just always been there. It just, uh, whether it's through self-expression or just feeling more of who you are and who you're meant to be. I think maybe the, I should have asked what was the, the seeds because it seems obvious that the seeds were planted way back then just in the things that we we do in our lives in any case. Can I move us along to there is a relationship to be had with both of our images. There's the the character, the the smile, the the expressions that you've both brought out in there. Is there a legacy story? And I've watched some of the interviews that you've both had um, with with both pieces. But is there a is there a legacy story, or is there a pattern there that you can share that hasn't been shared yet? And if something has been shared, Kate Pai will take whatever. Um, story we can get. What was that legacy story that we're trying to um, express to to everyone in, in your piece? First up, you got the mic. First. I got the mic. <laughs> uh, for my piece, um, it's something I've always wanted to do. Um, as you mentioned earlier, um, I just kind of fallen into photography through mahi, um, and the opportunity to take photos of Fano was 
had been always been on my heart and it was rather coincidental in a way um, that it was my uncle's birthday coming up and he's such a been such a primary figure in Alfano for for so long but in saying that I've only really get, gotten to know him recently in the last couple of years because um, my grandfather would um, which is his nephew he passed away in 2008 and so through his passing there was a real disconnect from our wider whanau and um, going down to the marae and things like that so we had a whanau reunion um, and my uncle Nana Pat came along and helped facilitate that um, opened up the marae and we had a, a korero with him about whanau about whakapapa and it just illuminated um, so much for a for our whānau and it, I guess it sparked more in me about reconnecting and, and learning about my identity and then he also was inspired by our whānau reunion so he organised a bigger reunion for the wider whānau, uh, king of kingi whānau and so um, it really just started with wanting to connect and wanting to celebrate and also uplifting Fano, and you know by getting to know my uncle more I was getting to know my granddad more who, who had passed so it was really a, a personal journey for me and it was taking the opportunity to get a photo of him and then when the awards came up I thought oh, I'd love to throw throw that into the into the hat and um, kind of in a way feel like I was doing something to to acknowledge him and, and keep his legacy um, going and, and um, reconnecting with my whānau and, and remembering my, um, my kōrō as well. It's a beautiful legacy to, um, to pull out each time I do. Look at Uncle Pat, there's a, there's a familiarity all the time, connecting the same, that there's a, everyone has an Uncle Pat, I think is, that has been said, that reconnects your whānau back into the, into the marae. Regan, what, I've read so much about our matriarch, Huhana, but can you share with us a part of that, the legacy that led you to creating the piece? Um, for me, uh, when we think back in history and how history has been recorded mm. and who's recorded our history, certain people have had their voices shared and certain people have shared other people's voices in a way that they interpret the world. Uh, for me it's, it was important to um, share her mother's story because she was one of those guides from Whakariwiriwa who wasn't bolshi, she wasn't, didn't have a, a, you know, she wasn't out there, she just did the mahi. Uh, at the time um, that she was around, uh, the Tohunga Suppression Act came in. So women were forced to go and birth in hospitals Previous to that, they had a, you know, almost 100% success rate with births. When women went to the hospitals, 50% of those women or children um, would die in childbirth. So a lot of women from the pa would go to Nanny Huhana to have her babies in secret because they trusted her and she, she would help them through. So you know, those kind of stories aren't told. Um, people don't know who they are. And uh, I think those are important times for us to remember um, that sometimes the safest place is with your nanny or is with the people who know you best and know how you're, you, um, you know, the best way to, to do things for you. Uh, yeah, so I think just reflecting on that and, and also I wanted to paint her because I had a ride with one of my friends from Wellington and uh, she was a, a student uh, at university and you know as students you explore these different concepts and, and you grasp onto somebody's um, theory and then you explore them in your own way and uh, she was exploring the Māori maidens mm -hmm. and a lot of our tūpuna you know are, are said to be projected as Māori maidens and sexualised and all these sort of aspects yep. Uh, but what she had done is she had taken that concept and kind of, for me, warped it a little bit and made a mockery of um, 
a Māori maiden concept by pretending to be a Māori maiden at the waterfront. You know, made it into an art piece type thing. She's telling me this and I just was getting quite upset and I said to her, that's my tūpuna you're talking about. That's their stories and for me they had a lot of mana and they actually knew exactly what they were doing being in those postcards because what they were doing was they were promoting a work life and bringing in money for their families so that they could survive. You know, for me, those women have huge mana and for you to belittle them like that was, was really, actually got me really angry at the time. And I, as you can see, I'm a little bit more still emotional. <laughs> And like I love my friend, you know, and she, it's, she's wonderful and she thinks about all these things, but those kind of um, interpretations and then from our own, belittling our own, um, wasn't acceptable to me. So for me it was about sharing Puhana's story, that she was actually a matriarch, she wasn't just a Māori maiden. Yeah. And maybe they were on cards and, you know, they were saying we're Māori maidens, but it was about the promotion of us as Māori yeah. and our wonderful gifts and who we are. So, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting kind of dynamic and I think we need to be careful when we're exploring things that happened in the past when we weren't there from our own yeah. um, perspective now and saying, well, they were doing this and they were, you know, taking the power away from those wahine who were actually really mana at the time, and, you know, entrepreneurs. You, you, you've, you've read my question, so it, it seems. I might just skip the one that I had in mind, because um, what I did want to uh, ask about was we're living in a time of COVID-19. COVID it's changed so many things. Um, and if I think about you know, the tourism, um, just pull out that part in there, the tourism part of it, the economic development, the entrepreneurship and the role that our matriarchs had in um, bringing that to life, just being a part of that whole thing there. There's, um, yeah, that in itself is significant. So if we come into, you know, where we're at at the moment, um, and needing to ignite our tourism industry, needing to ignite um, these social infrastructures between us all. What, can we talk a little bit about the message, Huhana's message into a contemporary form today and, and that sort of legacy in today's sense of economic development? Because there's lessons in there. I mean, you, you, you talked about um, it's not just posing on a postcard. It, there's a message behind that that I too can be part of an industry um, that creates wealth for everybody. That that showcases not just Māori artistry, but our sense of business and things like that. Um, well, I agree with um, what was what you already yeah. said actually. Uh, I just um, want to go back a little bit. So um, when we do something, often um, our own are the first ones to put us down for doing it and, and trying to achieve something different and pushing outside of the box. But um, you'll see that it's the ones who are on the fringe, the ones are who, thinking, who are thinking outside the box and the ones brave enough to try it and give it a go they're the ones who are actually becoming the leaders and, mm -hmm. and sometimes people have to see that it's successful before they'll kind of move yeah. over and, and go. But you know, most people, they like to follow the path that they know and to go outside of that can be really scary. So sometimes, well often as entrepreneurs, we have to be brave enough to go beyond, okay. to go outside of and just give it a go. Yeah. Because yeah. if we don't, if we carry on doing what we've always done, we'll get what we always get. Yeah. I know that. Yeah, so hope that. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Bodhi, there's a, you talked about reconnecting, Uncle Pat, reconnecting, or bringing our whanau together in an Uncle Pat way. If I think about, um, you know, the experiences that we've had over the last two years, there's been an absolute need to 
rethink our social infrastructure and how we can still or reconnect. Are there messages out of Uncle Pat's story to guide us forward in reconnecting with each other? Mm. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of there's a lot in that. I think uh, both for for us generally around um, the world that we live in now. Um, we've never been so connected, yet we've never been so lonely at times as individuals, and we can often hide and get lost in that, um, I feel. Um, I think the other side of it, for Māori, and as we, and there's been so much happening over the last two or three years, um, I think there's an opportunity to we almost have to be innately aware of it and, and deliberate about it because if you're not, it's going to slip away, it's going to, it's going to disappear. And I think that's, there's a real, almost a, I don't know, a pandemic or a, an urgency about it that we have to be deliberate in reclaiming our whakapapa, reclaiming our stories. Um, because, you know, my, my granddad passed away, I can't, Get those stories back um, so that in, in my portrait of Uncle Pat and getting to know him as a person that was just as important as taking the photo and making establishing my whakapapa out of just names on a paper to illuminating them and, and to hearing their stories because um, our history is really important um, it, it, and I, I feel as a society we've, we kind of lose that we get ca caught up in the moment and we make, make myself feel old here, but you know, when I was young, <laughs> we, <laughs> you spoke about, you know, remembering your past so you don't make the same mistakes. And I feel like um, everything's going so fast, but we really need to reflect and, and, and take, slow things down a bit and, and really um, ensure that, and this is not just for Māori, for everyone, that we go back to what we understand of ourselves and then you find yourself in that a little bit more and then it can help settle you into where we need to be to be going. And I think whānau and relationships in general are important because otherwise in this consumer world we just end up consuming one another and, and, and I think that's really tragic that you know we're so busy and so caught up in things that we need to do that you know we, we're almost just processing one another and um, I don't, I don't want to do that, and I'm guilty of it I'm <laughs> myself, but just trying to pull that back and, and be in the moment and um, appreciate the relationship with, with whānau and, and those that you um, are in your circle. Power of, um, power of toy. Um, so there's the different medium, there's photography and then there's, there's a, a painting. I, I'm quite like I get to look at both of them while I'm asking you both these, these questions. Can you share an aspect of the artistic process that you, you went through? Is it, um, you know, there's a distinctiveness around the patterning of Uncle Pat's plaids and how they show up and how the light reflects of them. Can you share a part of the process you went through? I'm going to give you the full okay. undisclosed version of it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I borrow a camera from work. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> and I've got a, a 50 mil camera, oh, sorry, 50 mil lens that is kind of shoddy. It, it doesn't zoom and focus properly. So I've, I've already set myself up for a tough time already. And I live up in Manirewa and uh, Nana Pat lives in Huntley, but we met up at my auntie's house uh, just across the road from Horohoro Marae. And they knew I was coming down, well my auntie did anyway, um, I was coming down for lunch and to take uh, uncle's photo. Um, so I get in there, she's just finished making a boil up, so I have to oblige. <laughs> <laughs> And um, once that's done, and, you know, I'm having, they're actually in the throes of having, having a really good korero about whakapapa. Um, uncle had a cousin from um, Waiku visiting that he hadn't seen for a long time. So I'm sitting there 
eating my boil up, listening to this, and this is like, this is like dream stuff. It's like I was learning about um, his history. You know, this is three generations above me, two, three generations above me, and I'm like listening. They're like, um, you know, it's just surreal. And then, you know, my auntie be my auntie's like, right, Bodie, you wanted a, um, you wanted your uncle Pat. He goes, oh, what, what, what are we doing? Are we? Um, and he didn't know I was, I was coming to take a photo. I was like, oh, I'm actually coming to take a photo, uncle. And surprisingly, in that moment, like a lot of our whanau, young and old, as soon as you mention photo, people like, they find the closest wall to them <laughs> as they can find, and, and, and just their personality just disappears. It just, they just become this other person. Anyway, like, he was really up for it. You know, he was like, oh, cool. And he was just wearing his whatever he wears. And then my auntie pulls out this blazer and he's just straightens himself out. And I really wanted to actually, in that moment, at that time, take a photo of him and his cousin. Because this was for them and for us, it was, uh, um, it didn't happen that often. And I, I wanted to capture the moment that they could remember and, and their connection and their whakapapa. And so I sat them both down. My, uh, his cousin, my uncle was, sitting there smiley happy as and and then my uncle was sitting there just not giving me anything <laughs> and it was my my auntie lives in a small whare and the sun was beaming in and i was starting to get, get a bead on i was sweating and things weren't re re really working out so there was no real setup other than sitting in front of a chair and i managed to get them in a nice kind of white background um, didn't plan any of anything that he was wearing any of the lighting it was really just um, trying to capture that moment and take the opportunity to to get a photo of him um, so over the process of getting a photo of both of them then my uncle was cousin hopped out of the photo I said right uncle I need a photo of you and he just wasn't giving me anything and so <laughs> it was just a almost like a battle you know he's a standoff I'm like come on give me a photo and then every time the camera wouldn't it would uh, lock on the, the focus so I had to like physically jam it back in get another photo anyway I think I was just at that time just trying to crack a joke with him and trying to get him to give me something and I must have said something and he, he gave me a little a little half a smirk and that's when I was able to uh, take the photo and yeah I mean that, and I was able to um, present that photo back to him of him and his cousin uh, at his birthday that we had at the, the marae. So um, that was really cool and um, yeah, that, that was kind of how the whole thing played out. So it was a really um, special moment uh, just to be there and, and get that photo. I feel even more closer to Uncle Pat now having gone through that process and, and understanding. But there's a process that goes through when you create these masterpieces. Well, I never met her. She passed away before I was born, but we always had black and white photos of her. Yeah. Uh, for me, and um, you're familiar with my work, I love colour. Yeah. Uh, and for me, it was important to incorporate colour into the piece mm -hmm. to really reinvigorate that life force and life energy um, and reflect the time that she lived in. So when I was doing my masters, uh, my professor he questioned my colour palette. And he's like, oh, you know, I don't know about your colour palette, where is that from? And when I considered it, it was actually from the geothermal activity that I grew up around, where orange sits alongside turquoise and green sits alongside purples and reds. Uh, and those contra contrasting colours really make each other pop and shine yeah. and give a vitality that uh, this side of the world in Aotearoa our colours are very vivid and strong, whereas over in Europe, they're in kind of a subtle, more subtle, mm -hmm. duller kind of colour. That's the atmospheric interference and in, in how the land kind of looks. So for me, it's a real reflection of our fresh, crisp, bold colours yeah. here in Aotearoa. Uh, but, and, and it's nice that you observe those um, aspects with your rings and things like that. There were a lot of, a lot of things kind of that were hidden. Yeah. And if you spend a bit of time with her, then you will find those things. But if you just walk past, you'll see this queer smiling, which is really lovely. So those ones that take the time to sit and actually look will find yeah. those little 
tins and the rings. So there's a little puka yes. on the ring. So Pukapi features in my work quite often. Mm. And his narrative is, um, so he features on the 20 cent coin. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people I've asked don't know anything about Pukaki or very, know very little. And, you know, people in museums, often they'll know a little bit more. Uh, but most people don't know where he's from, uh, that he's a prominent ancestor of Tarawa, don't know his children's birthday, anything like that. But when you flip over the 20 cent coin, Queen Elizabeth is there, and you um, know who she is, where she lives, her whakapapa, uh, her birthday, all sorts of things about her, and she doesn't even live in Aotearoa. Um, so for me that's a, a, you know, a narrative that needs to be highlighted. Um, why is that? Mm -hmm. That our prominent ancestors here, we're not educated about, but we know all about somebody who doesn't yeah. live here, so those sort of things. Um, yeah, so it's beautiful you saw that. And then, and then there's two different styles of painting, so one of them's kind of blocked out yep. in the background. Uh, so it's slightly stylized, and the front is painterly. And you know, I hear these uh, rules of painting, and you don't mix styles and all those sort of things, but it was purposeful. So yep. the background's there because those queer of the time, they did a lot of weaving and a lot of, a lot of fatu. Uh, a lot of um, bodices, you know, those sort of things. Yeah. So it kind of, for me, as I as I was painting it, it was like I was reflecting on their work that they would do, which was long and laborious, but pleasurable. Uh, yeah, so there were a lot of those aspects in that, in that piece, so thank you for picking it. Oh. I, I was going to ask, um not in this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. If they, there is another ring on there, on she's got the other one on her hands, and if that's a stone, if that's still around today. Uh, well, in the photo, she was actually wearing rings. Yeah. Yeah, and um, that's the thing with um, our toll now. You know, mm. And actually, I was talking to an uncle just yesterday, and he was saying that one of her heitaki, similar to this one, is a yes. uh, But we never knew about it, I never knew about yeah. it. Uh, but most of it tonga are gone and we don't know where they are, so that ring I've is seen, yeah, in real life. So don't know there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole other journey inside that, isn't there? Um, so I know that we've probably got some of our aspiring artists that will We'll watch our video. Um, is there a is there an inspiration that you can offer for those that are on the journey? Maybe not take camera from work. <laughs> no, I'm joking. If that is the advice, <laughs> but what's the um, if there was a couple of things that you could put in a kitty and then we could gift that off to our aspiring artists, what, what would be some things, Bodhi, that you'd pop in there? Well, first off, um, I just wanted to say the, the, this whole process and, and, and being part of the, um, the awards was confronting for me because I entered and then I got the call back to say that I was one of the pieces selected. And then I was talking to my friends and, and I was like, well, I guess I'm a photographer now. I guess I'm an artist. And then, you know, um, winning was again, like even more confronting. It was like, I'm an artist. And because I, you know, through my mahi, through my past, I've, ne I've always loved art not just photography but all, all forms and I've always had a massive appreciation for it um, but I've the, the, my career that I've got path that I've gone down was very kind of like I've you know um, set myself up in graphic design and I was in, in that for 10 years and then moved into uh, the Warriors and for those that know my whanau is how we bleed rugby league and so it's, I was almost drawn to it from, a, from that sense, um, but in a way where I wasn't playing because I'm hopeless. Uh, <laughs> never had the courage to run it, run it straight. But um, to, to do something in, in a space where it involves um, graphic design, videography, photography, I was able to 
partner to things that I love doing. Um, so I guess the, the biggest um, piece of inspiration is do what you love to do, do what is almost you're made to do, like you've destined to do and also not um, get hung up on what that, post, what that is. Um, so I started as a graphic designer and to the point where I was falling asleep at my desk because it, I just it became unfulfilling. I also, because um, my friend said, oh hey, let's go do animation. And so the year after I studied graphic design, I did two years of animation, which I love animation um, and wish at some st stage I could still uh, do something like that. But um, after those two years, I fell back into graphic design and, and did that for, for many years. Um, but in terms of photography specifically, it, like you mentioned, it was um, just something I fell into. As I've always been interested in photography. Um, another backstory is um, I failed sixth form at, at school. Um, I slacked off and didn't make much of an effort, but it was my art teacher that saved my, um, my time at school and she put through a, a recommendation for me to continue on to seventh form and got me dispensation to pick up a whole lot of art classes, including art history and, and, and art. Um, and I wanted to do photography and she basically said, oh, you, you can do all of them if you want. And um, unfortunately, there weren't enough um, students doing photography at the time, so that kind of just didn't happen. Um, my colleague was doing photography at, at Mahi, and he left. And our, the guy who replaced them wasn't doing as much photography. And I kind of, at that time, photography scared me because I had no idea how any of the technicalities worked. And so I just. Um, over time, just picked it up, um, learning, taking terrible photos. Um, but it was the, the desire to kind of explore and, and try. And I think my message or to anyone would be do what you're made to do. And, and it's, there's, some, there's that spark or that fire in, inside of you to um, to let it out and, and explore and try, thing, try things out. And I tell that to myself, like, I'm like a walking contradiction. Like, I say that, but I need to tell myself that as well, as to, you know, what are you doing? How are you, um, where are you applying yourself? What are you trying to, like, I would recently, like, um, love trying um, jewelry making or, or something like that, you know, or, you know, being amongst some of these amazing artists just, I was like crying, <laughs> um, you know, and, and talk about inspiration, you know, like I follow many of them on Instagram and, and uh, you know, to be standing next to them to, oh, it just, it's just unreal. And yeah, I, I would love to see um, people step into and not um, impede themselves in doing, um, doing art or being creative or doing what they love or, um, being who, who they are and the cool thing about my parents when I said I wanted to do graphic design they didn't even blink like it just and I but I wished maybe that I was like oh, I'm gonna go to uni and, and study art for three four years like that would have been cool as well but you know my journey is my journey and I'm you know grateful to to be here and, and to have this opportunity and to and to continue that journey of exploring um, both um, my own identity, but also um, different expressions and art forms that, that, are, that are there. Beautiful. Thank you. Oh, every, every, every word that comes out is a, is a tongue into the kiti. And your koha into the kiti for our aspiring mahi toi, ringa toi? Um, Bodhi brought something up, and I think that one of the hardest things to do is to acknowledge that you're an artist. Mm -hmm. You know, once you actually call yourself an artist, then so much more kind of happens. So you start the journey, even though it's already started, but in your mind you kind of switch into being an artist. Uh, and then once you're an artist, 
and it only takes you to say I'm an artist to be an artist, by the way. <laughs> um, then things kind of just happen. Uh, and um, being an artist is very courageous. Yeah. And I see you. You're very great, courageous. Uh, one of um, the most profound things that I uh, heard once was from Darcy Nicholas, and I love Darcy Nicholas's work. He sells his work for $40,000 plus a painting. And he can paint a painting, a full painting, in an hour, but that's from years of practice. Yeah. He said to us once, you know, I wasn't the most amazing artist in my art class at school. There were lots of kids that were way better at art than I was. But the difference was is that he persevered and he stuck to it. You know, when those other students left school, they put their artworks, hid them under the bed, yeah. or they, you know, they didn't show them. Or art came naturally to them, so they didn't have to try hard. But what he did is he stuck to it, and he kept trying and trying, and sometimes he failed. Sometimes uh, things were just so hard, but he just stuck to it. And now he's one of our most prolific Māori artists and I'll tell you what, and I just absolutely love his work. So, whenever I find it hard, I think of those words, and I think, yes, there's always going to be people that are way better than me at doing stuff, um, but who cares, you know? Who cares? The main thing is I'm doing what I love, and I'm just, I'm just doing it. And you know, eventually, so I've been practicing art for a long time now, and I look back, and actually, because I've kept trying and kept doing stuff, and some things are a little bit crazy, some things, you know, people like, what? I have a really big portfolio now of work that I've done mm. and projects that I've been involved in and I've learned so much in all of them. And sure, most of them haven't worked out um, exactly how I wanted it. Yeah. There's been big faux pas that, you know, but if those hadn't have happened, then I wouldn't know what I know now. And I wouldn't be the artist that I am now, so. Uh, my advice would be just to persevere, keep going. Um, believe in your journey and believe in yourself because it doesn't matter where you end up and yeah. you're moving forward and one day you'll look back and you'll realise you've done it a lot and your life has been richer for it. So, kia ora. Yeah, yeah, I don't know how we're going for time but I might just... I forgot that there were people outside of us who get so enraptured um i won't even try to summarize but if i pulled out some some points out of our corridor <clears throat> this is a corridor that i will tell my grandchildren and i won't be talking about or as um you know as prominent as they are the the goldies and the lindows and and those representations i will be telling my grandchildren um, my children when I get home, I sat with Regan Bowser and Bodie Friend and we had a corridor about these portraitures and they will be those defining pieces that will inspire our uh, emerging artists for, for many, many years to come. But as you both say, teach them about, um, about persevering, about being brave and being okay with being brave and and stepping out and doing what they love to do and but standing up and saying I am an artist right now I'm an artist and going down that that journey so I did want to thank you both for this precious time that we've had together and and just the amount of sharing that we've had today to find out if you join me in in thanking our <laughs> ministry and a big um, hand for Tim Potter as well.